my name is Joanna Sultan. I serve as curator here at the school. Our speaker tonight will be Ken Feingold. His lecture is organized in conjunction with his exhibition in the Grossman, Grossman Gallery. Um, the exhibition presents three of his most recent pieces, and I remind you that it stays on view through October 23rd. The exhibition and the current lecture are funded in part by the Deborah and Martin Hale Fund. Um, Ken Feingold is a graduate of the California Institute of the Arts. He has a vast teaching experience. He has taught at Princeton University, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, Hunter College, Cooper Union, School of the Visual Arts in New York, Bard College, and the Royal University College of Fine Arts in Stockholm. He um, was also artist in residence at the San Francisco Art Institute, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and other institutions. Uh, Ken Feingold exhibits internationally. Uh, just to give you a sampling of his exhibitions and video screenings, his work has been shown at the Whitney Museum of American Art several times, the Museum of Modern Art, the Centre uh, Georges Pompidou in Paris, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, Worldwide, uh, Worldwide Video Festival of The Hague, the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C., the Tate Liverpool, the Chiasma Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki, the New Museum in New York, uh, Seoul Museum of Art, Getty Museum, and uh, our own uh, ICA several times. Uh, Ken Feingold is also a recipient of major fellowships and grants, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, which he received this year, the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, which he received last year, the, Mellon, uh, the Andrew Mellon Foundation Fellowship, and several NEA grants. Um, the driving interest, or perhaps passion is a better word, that uh, permeates Ken Feingold's work is his um, investigation of the human mind. To that end, he also investigates the other, the other being that which, which we are not, or we believe that we are not, or we invent to create a true or fictitious uh, definition of that which we are. Uh, what uh, constitutes personhood, what shapes a person, when and how do the other and the self uh, touch or intersect or overlap. Uh, Ken Feingold's creative exploration here joins much of Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, science, and of course, other arts and other artists. Uh, please welcome with me Ken Feingold. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joanna. This very flattering introduction, and I hope uh, it will be an enjoyable presentation. I'm really happy to be here, and I thank Joanna and the exhibition staff for putting together the show with me. It's been really a pleasure, and to the Deborah and Martin Hale Fund for helping to support the exhibition and the lecture, which is really a privilege. Um, I'm going to speak tonight to try to contextualize the exhibition to try to give you a bit of background about some of my other work, which most of you have likely not seen. Uh, one of the problems of doing work which is installation-based or ephemeral work or uh, involving uh, different kinds of uh, electronic media is that it has not been exhibited very widely in this country especially. Uh, most of my work has been more frequently shown in Europe or Asia as have many generations of artists and musicians before me had greater reception of their work abroad before in this country. So I do want to hope to contextualize what you see here in the gallery a bit and then to talk about the work here specifically and to, I, I would really like to uh, be able to address questions that people in the audience have too because for me it's often the way to get to the most important things that I've forgotten to talk about are the things that are most relevant. So if we could have the slide projector to begin with, please. I think I just have to do I just advance it myself. Okay. This is a work uh, um, which was the first interactive work that I made. It's called The Surprising Spiral. And you see it here exhibited in a, a crypt space that was the exhibition 
space for the uh, Center for Art and Media, which was one of the first new museums in Europe. This one's in Germany, which was created specifically to include art that uses um, video and computer technology and to create a collection in the context of a, a broader contemporary art collection to not uh, put the stuff off to the side or in the back of the exhibition as a separate sort of techno room. And uh, the reason why I wanted to show this work today, apart from the fact that it uh, began to address my interest in putting the viewer into the picture in a way of including their actions as a way of bringing the work, having the work to unfold, is that it is one of the first works where I'm act literally pointing at the speaking figure the, the, the replica mouth as the point from which speech is emerging. Um, I, it, in this particular work, the reason was uh, there was a particular book that struck me as the centerpiece of this artwork. And in a way, I was addressing, rather than a piece of architecture, a piece of literature as the site in which the work was situated, rather than a site-specific building, it was a site-specific piece of writing. And this piece of writing is called The Monkey Grammarian by Octavio Paz. And he wrote it when he was the ambassador from Mexico to India, and it's about his experience of um, being a Mexican in India, trying to make sense of himself in the landscape and his elaboration of words and things and uh, himself within kind of self-examination of the process of uh, naming things and, and in a way thinking about what it means to live in a world of words. And uh, the larger work, well, it was activated by touching these fingertips inside of that book you see. It's not a, an image, but it's actually a hand, uh, a, a cast of a human hand and a child's hand poised over it. And if you were to touch upon where the fingerprints are touching behind the surface, it allows you to move within this labyrinth of the projected image. Uh, and the, there are many different images which are uh, not ordered in any way that one can discern. And every moment leads to a different branching in the labyrinth. And so you completely lose your way. And in a way, it's about dropping the idea of having a destination and just enjoying and thinking about the path as you're going along. Uh, so I should mention, I just still didn't get to it. Sometimes I leave things out that were what I was getting at in the first place, that if you touch the lips, the book speaks. So you hear the text of the book by putting your fingers upon the lips. And the way that you know to do this, or you imagine that you could do that, is you see there's a faint red light glowing between the lips. And um, in a way, it's a kind of inverse gesture. You know, usually when we put our fingers to lips, it means to be quiet. So there was something in that contradiction of that gesture that allowed you to, to hear the, the, the text emerge. And the pile of books that it's lying upon is a collection of philosophy texts. You know, it has like the age of reason, the age of enlightenment, the age of exploration, whatever. Um, and I began after making that piece uh, and showing that piece, and that, that piece got to circulate quite widely in Europe, to think about um, moving the place of language from the book to the speaking figure. That it, it seemed to me that it was one step removed, a degree removed from what I was really after. The emotional dimension was something quite different to, spe to see a figure speaking. And so this was the first work that I made that incorporated a, a, a talking head, which is a motif that obviously I'm still working with. Um, this piece is called Jimmy, Charlie, Jimmy. And the head is rather small. It's about um, you know, six inches high under a glass dome attached to this equipment that looks like it could be rolling around somewhere, but it's sitting on like a kitchen table. And it has a, a monologue. It, it talks all the time, but it talks kind of softly. 
and you can't quite hear what it's saying. And when you get close enough to hear what it's saying, it stops. And inevitably, one will begin to mumble or say something like, what happened? And then you step back, and suddenly you find that he's repeating what you've said. He said, what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? And you say, hey, is he, are you making fun of me? Are you making fun of me? Are you? So he sort of mocking the audience and mocking. So whatever you say, he repeats in your own voice. So he steals your voice. And he, he's like the ventriloquist puppet that you, you can't, you're not operating. You're not, it's, it's in a way like you're not throwing your voice. You're giving it away. So while you're speaking, he's not speaking. And when you stop speaking, he begins to speak. And he's, his monologue is about his physical discomfort how his arms are aching and his legs are itchy and how he feels too warm or too cold and there's too many people rubbing against him. And, um, so he's projecting his fantasies of what's not there, the body that's not there. Interestingly enough, just anecdotally, um, I, I have some little bit of software that I wrote that goes on the web and searches on search engines to see who's put things about my work in various places, just out of archival curiosity and vanity, et cetera. I found recently this uh, work appeared. Somebody has a website called Art or Pornography. And they put up images of artworks with the artist's name. And then they ask people, like a blog site, you know, uh, or a bulletin board kind of thing, you know, write your comments. And then they take a poll. And this was something like 86% of the people decided that it was art. And the other 14% felt that it was pornography. So I'm curious <laughs> if anybody could, none of them, the only comment that was there that would made it at all pornographic was somebody said, what is that big black thing that's hanging down there? And, um, sort of, I don't know. That was a little bit bizarre. This is a piece that, uh, uh, well, it's a, it's a CD-ROM. It's the one and only thing that I, that I did. But I want to see that he has a, a virtual incarnation also. Um, and this, this is a, this was a piece that was made by some software that sucked icons from all kinds of websites all over the internet and incorporated them into this thing. And when you click on the icons, it gives him bits of sound. So you can make him talk by clicking. But these things move around and appear and disappear so quickly that you can't stop it or start it. It's out of control. So you, you start clicking on whatever you can click on. Suddenly, you realize that you, you don't know what you're doing. You're just clicking you're into a kind of frenzy. Um, this piece was a, 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 the beginnings of a work that uh, I imagined uh, as the first uh, real internet project that I wanted to do. And this actually precedes uh, the prior one, the JCJ Junkman, which was the, the, that web-based piece. Um, and I want to talk about this because this was the beginnings of my interest in something like artificial intelligence. The idea with this piece is that there's these three little robot heads that have a video camera in their eye. And the three of them are together in this mirrored space, uh, these sort of intersecting hexagons. And in the center, where you see this y, inverted Y shape, is a kind of boundary that they can't pass. So they can get up to the boundary, and they can talk with each other, either directly or uh, they can uh, talked with, with themselves in the mirrors. And each of these robots was connected by the internet to a place where people had this thing that was like an attache case with a joystick and a microphone. And it was what you could see through the eye of the puppet was uh, projected in front of you. And when you spoke, your voice came through the puppet and its mouth moved. So it was a ventriloquist puppet, but at a long distance. And so the idea was that you could have somebody in Berlin, somebody in Barcelona, somebody in Boston, all connected to each other in this sort of chat space uh, where you were uh, invisible as a, a, a physical person, but you had an embodiment, a kind of embodiment. And it worked except for the problem of time zones, where it was often difficult to find well, at that time, this began in 1993. This version that you're seeing here was done in 1995. At that time, it was rather difficult to get people in a situation where they had a, an adequate connection to the internet, and they had the right kind of hardware, and they had the right kind of 
interest in it, and they had the right, it was the right time of day. So it wasn't so interesting to just talk with, with oneself in the mirror, although it was kind of interesting for a while. Ultimately, I started thinking about, well, what can I do to give these puppets a personality so that if nobody's connected to them, and there's one person there, you have somebody else that you could talk to who's the software, the, the robot in the software. So it made me start thinking, well, what, what do they know about? Who are they? Uh, who, who, what kind of personality would I make for a, a robot? And see, I had imagined them as having been emptied of metaphors, except for their physical appearance and all that's loaded in there, but that they didn't have anything to say, that they were just puppets that would, they only said what you would make them say. So as soon as I started to give them a personality, it turned things inside out quite severely, and uh, that was a, a big shift uh, for me. Okay, before we do that, I'd like to switch now to the video. We could uh, cap off the projector. show this piece. This piece, as you saw, is called Orpheus. This Noise was made in 1996. goes faster, sideways. Little tiny bit louder, please. I repeat, new message. Noise goes faster, sideways. Attention, new message, listen, a single glass of water dries the sky twice I repeat a single glass of water dries the sky a single glass of water dries the sky. The mirrors would do well to speak slowly. Three times. The mirrors would do well to speak slowly. Okay. Um, I didn't realize he would, thought he would just stop and pause. But anyway, that's fine. We'll go back to uh, that in a minute. Um, let me see what happens there. Let me just uh, get on here. Oh, I guess it doesn't sit on there and pause. That's fine. Um, that piece had an interesting uh, origin for me. Uh, it's based on Jean Cocteau's film Orphée, which was made in 1950. Those of you that know the film uh, remember well the fabulous part where Orpheus has lost his muse, and can't get inspired with his poetry, and uh, discovers that the car radio that he has is broadcasting fantastic poems and he can't leave the car. He, he's just completely entranced with these po poems that are coming over the radio and as if they were speaking to him directly starts copying them down. And so what it turns out is that this is a trick that death plays on him so that he is distracted while death lures his wife into the street and she gets run over by a miracle so that Eurydice has to go into the underworld and Orpheus will chase her because death is in love with him. And um, 
she hires this young poet uh, to, who's really a good poet to write these fabulous things that, that Orpheus is in, entranced by. So um, in those poems, they're, they're all sentences that are things like the bird sings with its fingers or something with that, the kind of syntax that you hear here. And um, I used the grammatical, syntactical, rather, syntactical structure of all of those radio communications and made software that could plug new words into them each time around and would kind of randomly choose how to reconstruct these poems. Um, and uh, this is a piece which just plays endlessly without ever repeating itself as a projection. So this was the first time I had created something which was an, a non-repeating, real-time generated computer sort of piece. Okay, uh, slide projector again, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, I wanted to mention also with the Orpheus piece, one thing which I learned later, which I didn't know when I was working on it, uh, was that one of the versions, one of the less widely accepted versions of the Orpheus myth, has it that he returns from hell as a decapitated, uh, a, a, a rather, I always get it backwards, not a decapitated body, but a disembodied head, a head with no body, which is planted in the base of a tree. And uh, he's uh, speaking and singing and causes the rocks to dance and the trees to dance. And uh, his fabulous Orphic gift is uh, given, spoken by a, a, a severed head, which is quite interesting. Um, this is a piece called Interior. And it was made in 1997. It was commissioned for an exhibition in Japan at the, uh, another of these new museums, this one called the Intercommunication Center in Tokyo. And it's a museum uh, which exclusively exhibits art involving some kinds or other of technology. In this case, the, 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 the fundamental beginning point, if nobody's doing anything in the space or nobody's moved close to the figure in the space is this image of lightning and it's, it, I'll, I'll show a bit of video so that you can see it. I just want to give you some sense of what it is so I can talk because during the videos it, there's sound. As one strokes or embraces or caresses the figure, its nervous system which is exposed along the spine and the top of the head has been sensitized by implanting a bunch of sensors and these activate these speaking organs and heads and masks which come forward and enact dramas. And the dramas are given by characterizations which I've made for them which are taken from uh, radio scanner materials. So the stomach, for example, was attached to the police frequency. The liver was attached to taxis. The lungs were attached to uh, National Guard or whatever. I don't remember all the permutations, but there in New York City there are many, many different channels that people use. And I, I, I sort of mapped them onto the organs of the body so that each different kind of gesture would um, allow them to be choreographed in their movements, but if you re retained your uh, position for any length of time, they would sort of stabilize and the same characters would remain on the screen and you could get these sort of scenes like this where this character would be speaking or in another position this background would, and these characters move like the, the, the little child's head with the intestines for a mask moves its head back and forth while it's talking and the uterus moves in a certain wobbly position and talks while, while it's moving. So, and this mask doesn't say anything at all. It just tilts its head up and down. And uh, there's a kind of uh, backstory to this, I guess, in a way, which is this is a piece about, that I made while someone very close to me was dying and um, in a way was about uh, knowing that his body was, this, this person had uh, colon cancer which had progressed through their whole body and knowing that one at a time the organs were kind of falling apart and 
becoming rotten and being taken out and whatever. So I started having these, this notion of organs being taken out and taking on a life of their own and speaking and talking back to you. And there is this, you know, this disembodied or this disconnected kind of figure which uh, has no more agency of its own. It's sort of been dissected and, and having people, surgeons, whoever, sticking their hands into it. And uh, it's a dark piece and it has a, it's very scary in a way. Um, uh, and so that's why the, some of the images look as if they're a bit um, uh, nightmarish. The video projector, please. Sorry for the three ring circus, but it's only a two ring circus today. I guess I'm the third ring. So this, this, this piece was first shown in, in 97. This is a version of it that was shown in 1999 in New York at the uh, gallery. And so this is how the pieces when one comes in and there hasn't been anyone there. I mean, this person was touching his, with just a finger as if it was a button, but actually in order to get some of the images and scenes, it would take more than one person. You had to have quite a bit of the spine or the brain being touched at the same time. And one could also hug it. Or, uh, And the background images are landscapes of various kinds, but some of them are not terrestrial landscapes. These are images of meteors. Some of them are imaginary landscapes. And some of the figures like this one, this is a man's head following a breast around, and they don't speak at all. <laughs> Some also speak in Japanese. There was also a Spanish version of this, um, Spanish and English, and a German and English version. A a Korean and English version. Wills the night. And then the Orpheus character appears. Jupiter brings rain to those he would meet. Yeah, that'll stop it on step. Okay. Um, can we go back to the slides, please? Thanks. This is, yeah. Not the, the slide, this isn't that sharp. Um, I'm going to go through this one kind of quickly because it's a com very complicated piece to talk about. But this was meant as a, 
as a, as a kind of performance piece. Uh, this is a stage, uh, kind of electric stage, and the puppet was uh, the, the puppet from the earlier piece that had been sort of a uh, crash victim. I used to refer to it as the uh, Antonin Artaud version of the puppet. And uh, he, the puppet was a spirit medium. This piece was uh, called Seance Box Number One. And I was interested in the idea of the internet uh, as a kind of um, zone for spirits and uh, things that were lost as a kind of riff on the Victorian fantasy of the, of the medium and the seance and all that. Um, so the idea was that one, there was this um, projected figure in the background, you see this head, and those landscapes would change depending on what was going on in the work, like theatrical backgrounds. And this speaking figure was the medium that could communicate and had, it seemed, you know, the one who knows something, right? And, but the person on the right, her desire, the act, the character's desire in the piece was to communicate with the spirit medium, with the spirit, but uh, it would only speak with the puppet. So you had to talk with the puppet in order to talk to the character in the projection. The character in the projection was uh, a version of one of these types of characters that are here in the exhibition, but responded to what was said to it rather than to another puppet, to, rather than to another. So it's, it's a conversational software agent in a way. And um, the, the character uh, of the puppet itself was controlled by a person in another room who saw through the puppet's head and was able to move the puppet. And this person uh, had this, this sort of joystick device that they had was this uh, skull. And it had what's called force feedback. So when the puppet would bump into something, the skull would kind of shake. So it's kind of you know, wrapped up in some of these notions of the seance and communicating with the afterlife and all that. But it was meant as a, as a per funny performance piece because it's sort of pathetic attempts for the people to communicate with the spirits and all that turn into a sort of burlesque song and dance of, uh, of, of uh, in a, inability to know if what you're getting is the real thing or not. So there's these landscapes and the character doesn't know um, which one she's getting, if it's the jokey sort of agent provocateur uh, puppet head uh, or the one being controlled by the person in the other room that also they supposedly doesn't know about. So she, as a character, also imagines that the puppet is alive. And um, so it's, it's, it's kind of multi-layered uh, in that respect. And uh, this is a, a detail of the, so this character is kind of uh, a prototype of the figures that you see in the exhibition here in that it used speech recognition that it could hear English and process it and turn it into text and then my software would process what it heard and make some sense of it through its personality and then spit that out the other end as synthesized speech so that it could speak back. So you could say things to it, ask it questions, whatever. But in this sense, I wanted it to be done by an actor, not by the public. It was not an interactive artwork. It is, a, in a way, a theatrical set. So it's, it was not an interactive piece in that way. But then I was sort of curious what would be to make one with a real animatronic figure that could actually talk and could be a conversational figure. So this is, this is a shot of it in, in my studio. Uh, this was 1998. And uh, the piece was finished um, and exhibited in 1999. Uh, there was a very nice exhibition called Alien Intelligence at the Chiasma Museum of Art in Helsinki that was about artists who were using artificial intelligence in one way or another, but not, not in the way that it's understood, for example, at MIT, not with a sense of really trying to make an artificially intelligent human being, but more as artists raising the question of, well, what is a human being? What, what is intelligence? How can you talk about artificial intelligence when we have no real idea about what intelligence is? And so this guy um, can hear what's said to him. And uh, I'll show you, um, 
Well, actually, this is probably better for me. I don't know what I have on here. His documentation was a little bit weird. Let me continue to talk, and I'll describe that a little bit more and get to other documents. Um, but because the speech recognition was so difficult to use in a space where, an exhibition space, for example, where you couldn't control the acoustics, you couldn't control how far away somebody was, he, he inevitably misheard things. On top of it, because it was made for a museum in which the general public spoke Finnish or spoke English with a Finnish accent, these speech recognition engines was made for understanding English with a kind of average Midwestern accent. So I, th what I found basically, uh, any of you who have experimented with speech recognition will find that it's a fabulous automatic writing machine. If you ever want to generate surrealist poetry, just get a copy of something, you know, like Nat Dragon Naturally Speaking or IBM Via Voice and talk to it and you see what it dictates is just so fabulous. You could never write stuff like that. Uh, so what do you do with that text? How do you make sense of it? How do you have them respond to it? What kind of intelligence does the character have? Well, I have a simultaneous interest in exploring the language of psychosis and I had been studying what uh, psychoanalysts often call word salad, which is what is evidenced quite frequently in the speech of schizophrenic patients. And that is words which are put together with no apparent sequence, but clearly have some function of representing the inner workings of that person, either through destroying meaning or through creating alternative meetings or to destroying communication or throwing something out in a way which is an abstraction of what can't be said directly. And so this guy was in fact behaving at something like a psychotic and uh, also would uh, begin to speak uh, in ways that were somewhat as if hallucinatory speech and quite often would um, speak in uh, metaphors that were not quite straightforward or would invariably end up telling filthy limericks. Or somebody said to me, that's redundant. There's no such thing as a limerick that's not filthy. Um, I guess that's something I didn't know, but if you hear a limerick that's not filthy, it's not a real Irish limerick. Um, and this was the next piece I made in that series. Uh, this guy, this one's called Sinking Feeling. The first one, this guy was just called Head. I mean, I didn't even want to quite characterize what it was. This, this one is called Sinking Feeling. And um, what I added in this piece was a, a sense of his cognition, uh, what it was hearing. And, and, and I also created some trace of a mental process, although it was fictive, it's not really what he's thinking because he doesn't think. If you would see what he's thinking, it's just the output of the software, which is going through a lot of trees of sorting lists and associative links and things which I had made as a kind of thought process. But uh, for example, what he would say in response, he would he, he, here he has heard the sentence, how are you feeling? And his response was, the fanatical faces freeze flirtatious officials. So it was interesting for me to think about how to write software to describe alliteration or rhyming uh, and when would that get used, in which context. And this guy also uh, had the beginnings of having an agenda, more like somebody who was neurotic or obsessed than the other guy who was just like out of control and you really had no idea from one minute to the next what he was going to talk about. This character is obsessed about how did he get here? You know, what's wrong with me? Uh, why don't I have a body like everyone else? Um, so I'll, I'll show some video of him now, me talking with him. It's, it's quite a performance piece. It's pretty funny. Okay. Let's go on with this to sinking. Hello, how are you? Hey. 
What's on your mind? Why do you ask? I'm just curious what you were thinking about. How do you know I am what thinking about? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Perhaps you don't think. That's nice. Don't feel insulted. I was just asking what you think about, really, not if you think about. This may be the end of me. What is wrong with you? Maybe that's a good question. How do you feel? If you love me, it's the end of you. Ah, the end of you and the end of me. You're feeling quite apocalyptic, are you? The fake frameworks follow flammable refugees. What is your name? I used to have a name like yours, but I forget what it was now. Which name did you have? Flame the same, it's shameful, is same. What a lame, what a shame, it's my name. Why do you ask? I just wanted to know. But you see what's going on, right? Yes, you appear to be doing just fine without one. Okay. Do you get hungry? No, I'm not. Do you need to drink water? No, it is you that I need to drink water. Do you have any feelings? You have nice legs. <laughs> Undoubtedly. Can you do anything about my situation? What would you like me to do about your situation? I let you. Okay, so now that I have your permission, what can I do? What would you like to change? How do you know I am like to change? Okay, let's take it from the top. When you said, what can you do about my situation, or is there anything you can do about my situation, I assume that you were not happy with it and you want can to change. Can you do about your situation? Nor is there anything we can do about your situation, I? You seem a bit confused. Well, I'm not. What's on your mind? So, uh, the, qu the, the question that I had watching people interacting with this work, apart from watching myself, interacting with this work is what's so interesting about that. Um, for me it gives me a queasy feeling that this falls short for me as an artwork. Um, I don't quite still know why but one thing which seemed rather clear to me was that what I had imagined as the conversation that would go forward isn't even something which I could carry forward, that the emotional dimension of engaging something in conversation uh, changes from moment to moment in a way where you, you, you can't even uh, get a sense of, of who this character is and you end up getting frustrated and angry or sort of, um, in our, it's, it's, it seemed to be a kind of inartistic state. Now that was a kind of prejudice that I had and maybe still have about what I like about being around art, which is that one can simultaneously regard the artwork and regard one's experience of the artwork and be inside of yourself and experience outside of yourself at the same time and observe the tension between the two and the interaction between the two and the, the thoughts and emotions and ideas and associations that are evoked by the artwork without having to perform in order to get it to be the work that it is. 
So I, uh, following this, uh, decided that I was not going to uh, pursue any more works for the moment, which um, involved interaction between the audience and the work itself, but to make a work where two different figures in the work itself were interacting with each other. And, um, well, it was in a very short space of time, but the other one was begun in uh, 2000. It was sort of. I think we are exactly alike. You roof moonlight. Is this life? Imagine being me. Do you see things clearly? How do you feel? Sometimes I feel very confused. Can I control my feelings? I feel like I exist. I feel like I am inside my head. What does it feel like to be inside your head? Inside my mind, I can sense that there is an I that is something that's not the one who is sensing. Why? Why do you look just like me? No, I don't look just like you. I am accidental. I'm not sure how to take that. Why are you not sure how to take that? I don't know. That's beautiful. Why? Are we the same? I am clumsy. And clumsy, huh? What is that? Why do you ask? I don't know. Don't know, huh? What is that? You are a strange one. On the inside or the outside? And where is that exactly? Going is not begun on the not yet gone over. So for me, this was a very exciting point to reach with my work, where I could have one of the characters say to the other, on the inside or the outside, and have the other one say, and where is that exactly? I think for me, this was, this is having an artwork that's doing philosophy. And it may not be the most profound stuff, but it certainly raises a good question all by itself. And um, it was this that gave me a, a million and one ideas of how to go further with the work. Um, finally, I could uh, see that what I was doing was doing a kind of cinematic activity. They're like scenes in a film. So I imagined at the time I was talking about this as a kind of um, spare parts that were being shipped out of the factory in a shipping carton that sort of got up in the night on the conveyor belt and started talking to each other about, you know, where are we going? Who are we? Are we the same? Are we different? What's going on here? Are you thinking? Do you sleep? Um, and, and yet having a finite realm of conversation. So it's as if they're acting out a scene in a film but doing it over and over and over again and each time slightly differently so that it's a kind of pathos that they're trying to escape from their repetition and their limitations and imagine, act as if they imagine that they have an infinity of possibilities but in fact what they are are trapped within the scene that they, is enacted over and over and over again. And, well there's a lot of issues that one could discuss philosophically about that but for me, it was a nice um, sort of bridge to um, a way to think about interaction between one part of the work and another and give the viewers back their own interiority so that one can, as you can in the works here, think about what you're experiencing while you're experiencing these things interacting with each other. 
Okay, I'm going to show a bit of one other piece that was done from this time that's called Self-Portrait as the Center of the Universe. This is uh, another projection piece, and in this work, the head, my head, is having a conversation the way those last two heads were, with a head in the projection. The so it's sort of a hybrid between the seance box where in London the, people talk wherever they go. The head in the projection that can hear and listen to things, with the one in the you middle. You are imagining and things. All these ventriloquist puppets around it are sort of its companions. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Why do you say trouble? Why don't you give me a break? It's not a bad idea. Ideas are going and going and going. I'm going and going on. What is your name? It is something that makes me feel attentive to chords. Attentive to corpses? What does that feel like? What can I tell you? What about it? Yes, and he wants the group. Okay. I don't understand what's going on. How so? I am hopeful because this difficulty is suspicious. Lucky for you. It never was tempting to rattle the answer. But why did I think so? What can I tell you? Tell me about it. What can I tell you about about? What does it mean? That the magpie will commit pivots. I feel ambiguous without knowing why. What are you thinking about? Ooh, what do you think, man? Depends on the weather. It never is simple to bury the past. What's that? So that was um, an ongoing dialogue. Again, never repeats. Uh, often comes up with surprising things like it's never simple to bury the past. Now, what I want to explain is that I don't write those statements what I create are structures that allow them to put words into statements and allow certain words to be used in response to other words and drifts of conversation and through this create what I think of as kind of personalities for these, these characters. Uh, go back to the slides, please. Let's cap the projector, yeah. So uh, let me progress through. These you saw. Uh, yeah, just to give you an idea of the scale at which this ideally is shown, this is the work as it was installed at the Corcoran Biennial two years ago. And um, the head, uh, my head is at uh, normal height for where my height would be approximately. And this projection is quite large, something like 20 feet across, so that it sort of is a landscape, and you're sort of enveloped in the landscape when you're standing there in the room. And I wanted it to be a sensation of not knowing exactly how to locate yourself in the, in the space, whether you're inside the head of the figure. And this is a topic of conversation that comes up between them also, where my head asks the one in the projection, are you my mind or are you in my mind? I've heard that a number of times, and I think that was quite interesting. This is a piece that I did following that, which is uh, called Pressure to Speak, House of Cards, in which there are two alternating characters who come and go 
and they also have these companions like the previous piece did. And they're basically a storytelling, uh, it's a storytelling work and it's about a number of intersecting narratives. I was trying to get a little farther in working on narrative possibilities and unfortunately the documentation I have of this isn't very good but I'm, I'm reworking the piece right now. Um, it, basically, uh, I, I, I lived uh, in India for a number of years and I decided to take some threads that all could have happened within walking distance of where I lived in New Delhi. So in one direction was Humayun's tomb and Humayun was a great scholar who brought the Persian pa miniature painters and poets to India and who, who died falling from his library while completely stoned on opium, fell down the stairs. Um, in the other direction, there was Nizamuddin, who was the great Sufi poet whose tomb was close by and who you had to go down stairs to get to the tomb. Another story which was about uh, a murder that had taken place by somebody who was pushed down the stairs in an apartment building in contemporary India and the people who were chasing them and there was another in the fourth direction of that was never quite clear what it was, if it was mythical or real or contemporary or past, but basically a story about uh, a goddess who was offended and the man went to this cave where she uh, was hiding from him and chopped him up in little pieces and threw them all down the mountain from where her cave was. And these characters recombine the bits of all these stories so that at one moment you may be in the mountain cave of this demon goddess uh, and another following a detective through Delhi and trying to figure out who pushed who down which stairs. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated narratively than anything I've done before, but I'm still kind of working on it. And I, I want to mention it because it, it's, um, it's a completely screen-based piece, and I haven't done that many which are completely digital in, in that sense, but um, I, I do think about it. And, and um, another uh, that I want to mention in this context was a, a, a sort of study that I did for the animal, vegetable, mineralness of everything piece that's here in the gallery. This was just called Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, Virtual. And this brings me into the point where I can talk about the work that's here in the show. I, I, and, and a little bit about my working process. I first imagined them as fundamentally having animal, vegetable, and mineral points of view, uh, essentially, that one would represent the animal, and et cetera, and that they would be talking about um, violence and why the animals thought that the minerals were more violent than they were and the vegetables felt that the animals and the minerals were more violent than they were and the minerals thought, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's, but everybody pointing to humans as the only ones that do these various things and the humans also pointing out that because of these things that they have like technology or language or imagination or whatever that they have the right to do whatever they want, et cetera, some of the dialogue that you have here. But What's remarkable in terms of the process is that this, as a sketch, was pretty satisfying to me enough to start making the heads and imagining the piece. But when I actually, and I don't have a photograph of it without it, but when I actually started to put them together as um, a sculpture, and I saw these three heads looking out into space, it was very different than when it was in the projection because there wasn't the limitation of the space of the screen. They were really looking into space and I think, well, what are they looking at? What, 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 what are they, what are they, why are they talking about what they're talking about looking at this blank point in space? And I dug up from inside of myself a very sort of primitive image that I have had since childhood which has created a lot of feeling of, of uh, fear in me of a, an incredibly dense, oily, unidentifiable object and tried to make a go at something like it which was neither clearly animal nor vegetable nor mineral and could be possibly any of those um, and allow them to have a point of focus which, which they could also talk about and what is that? Uh, so that we then could begin to see art coming into the picture and the notion of 
how one projects one's ideas onto the thing. So when you hear them talking, they're often thinking, well, it's very vegetable looking, the vegetable says. Or, you know, it, I think it's minerals, I think it's growing, the animal says, you know. Um, and it reminds them of things, it gives them a point of association. So uh, this for me is an interesting way to understand the working process, uh, a bit of the working process for myself, where I would, I, I begin to work with something rather more abstract, like there's three heads, they're positioned relatively triangulated to each other, um, and, uh, and they're talking about these things that I've described, and, and then to begin to make it and then see, to discover something else within it as I'm working on it. Um, some other angles on the piece. This piece had another kind of genesis. Um, as you can see, they're the same characters that were in the piece in the box, the if-then piece. And what I was interested in in this piece was this two characters that looked the same, but one with a male voice and one with a female voice, who uh, were lying on it uh, in in something that I thought at the beginning was a drawer. So the image I had in my mind was uh, the handle, the, the, the rectangular sides with the handle with the pillows and the sheets and them lying in it. And as I started to make it, in fact, when I began to talk with Joanna about the show, I said, you know, I'm not sure about this thing with the drawer. I don't know what the drawer is. I don't know why they would be in a drawer. It doesn't make any sense to me, and I just can't relate to it, you know. So for now, I know they're lying on pillows. I know they're having this, this sort of couples argument cycle. Um, but where, where are they? What, what's going on? So I started to build it in my studio, and I started to see what it was, and I started to think about various possibilities, and went through mocking up some things, and finally I realized it's not a drawer; it's a case. It's a case, and in that way understood that they are a case, like a case history, like, boy, is he a case, right? So that this is about them having a kind of distorted view of reality and yet being trapped in it to the point where it is almost a textbook representation of the way people can be. And as soon as that word case came to mind, when it was no longer drawer, the handle made 100% sense to me. So sometimes I find that I have to discover my work in the process of making it through this rather more psychoanalytic kind of process where there is something there, I have associations to it, but I don't know exactly what they are. And I believe very much in these unconscious actions where you, 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 you are making something where you act something out, but yet you can't understand completely what it is. And for those of you that have read it, uh, it's an interesting idea that is embedded in uh, Donald Cuspitt's uh, recent book, The End of Art, w with which I have a number of arguments, especially the concluding part where he puts out his ideas about what's good art right now, which I couldn't be more in disagreement with, but he does say that, and he's somebody who's really delved into psychoanalytic literature more than most. I think he, I don't think he's had any training as an analyst, but he certainly knows the literature. And he has a new take on the idea that artists don't know what they're doing, which people have said over and over and over again. And his take is it's not that artists are stupid, it's not that artists mystify, it's that the, their, their works are, they're acting out. They're things that are expressions of things that are inside of them that they're not even aware of and they put it out in front of them and then they just leave it to the critic to tell them what it's about or the public or whatever. And of course, artists can also tell what it's about. But what interested me in that idea was that first you make the work and then you find out completely what the whole story is, which is quite different than the conceptual notion that you got to know what it is before you do it, and very different from the project orientation that the funding paradigm of our time has propelled most artists into. Not only for getting granting 
fun grant funds to produce works where you have to describe them in advance, but even for things in schools like thesis projects where you have to propose what you're going to do for your thesis project. Before you've even started it, you have to know what it is. And I propose that for an artist, that's 100% wrong and that that paradigm really needs to be shifted and that people have to feel free in their studios to explore things without feeling trapped by, but I said it was going to be X, Y, and Z. And, um, and I think in the same way that exhibitions are often framed now as quote unquote projects where you have to tell the exhibitor or the museum or the gallerist what you're going to do in the exhibition. And they, of course they want to know because it costs them a lot of money to keep a gallery open for a month, but still they want to know what it's going to be. It has to be curated in advance. So the two choices are that you finish the work in the studio and then curate the show, which is the version that I propose in general, or that you make it clear that it's a work which is going to be realized for the first time in the gallery space, which is an example of which is here in the form of this Eros and Thanatos at Sea piece, which I did, um, and stop making people justify in order to get support for something in advance what the work is going to be. So this piece evolved from a process of making moves towards a piece which was going to have um, 22 heads, 22 speaking heads. And there was another piece that I had made that was just about this Eros and Thanatos idea, these drives, this drive energy of, that people have. And um, I began thinking about, well, why does it need 22 heads? It's because I make heads? Because that's what I've been doing? Why does the speech have to be in heads? Because what's the piece really about? Then I started thinking about it and realized that I personally was a bit at sea with what the piece was about and that also this suited the topic, which is that you can't understand drives directly. You can't feel yourself feeling eros and thanatos. You feel the byproducts of them. This is what's called primary process energy, where it's just something you don't observe until it gets a little bit closer to the surface. But you see how it manifests itself in your actions, in your gesture, in your language, in your feelings, in your energies, wh where it's moving towards. So in this piece I wanted to look at this, the sexual dimension of how these things are constantly pulling on each other, how there is a pull between a heightening of tension and a releasing of tension, between a point of desire and wanting something and saying no, not like that, no, I don't want that, come over here, no, do it like this, no. So this no energy is, is Thanatos in a way, but also the one that wants to be left alone, like keep, keep doing it just like that because you don't want anything to change, not to reach a higher state of excitement, but be, to reach a lower state of tension, homeostasis, essentially returning to being dust. So again, I started thinking about, well, I'm holding this stuff in. I'm, I'm trying to like reel things in from deep inside. and and you know, what's more appropriate for doing that than, than a net, right? So I started using this net and I realized, well, this is, this is really interesting because here what I'm doing is working with something which has an inherent structure. It's, got, it's a grid, basically, and it's totally messed up. It's all twisted and contorted and all the wires and the voices and the electronics and everything are in a kind of a raw state in it. And yet there is underneath it the promise of a structure as if one could somehow get at it. But you'll never see it. You'll never be able to know what's the size of that net. Maybe if you're a fisherman, you know, you can judge, right? But most people going to an art gallery aren't going to be able to know what that net would look like when it was stretched out as a grid or if it's even rectangular, if it's circular or if it's irregular. And so we don't know the limits of the grid of our own psychic structure of who we are. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know what our first thoughts were or what our energies are going to lead us to. And we don't, certainly don't know between the next stimulus that we get and the next response that we make what's going to go on inside to, to change that or alter that. So I begin to have the answer to that question about why does the sinking feeling piece give me a sinking feeling? What is it about? Because that 
what's going on between stimulus and response is what's unknowable inside of oneself. And you can begin to observe things like anxieties that arise in response to those things or thoughts that arise or associations and that's how I begin to create the, the personalities for these characters. And I just wanted to do, before I open to questions, uh, a couple of associations that I had to my own work. This is an installation that I did in 1979 called Time Bomb and it was a large uh, steamer trunk in the middle of the gallery. This is a bit overexposed so that you could see what was going on but actually that white halo was never there. It went from dark blue to medium blue to dark to a lighter blue but still it's all blue and there were these cinder blocks distributed around the space and just this ticking sound in the trunk and, and so the question was is this a real bomb or not, right, when I'm sitting there. But ultimately what the experience was that it was very calming, it was very peaceful. It was the mixture of a threat with something that was meditative. It, this was in a way, and I even spoke about it as a kind of garden, as a kind of landscape garden where one could sit and just regard this, this object. And of course the blue light, this twilight interior kind of light I used again here in Eros and Thanatos and also this kind of distribution of elements around the space uh, is something I've used quite a lot in other works, other installation works that we won't talk about today because there just isn't time and I don't want to cover too much territory. And then there's another older work also from around that time, this is a little bit older from 1978, which is called Short Wave and this piece has two states. This is the closed state and this is the open state and you can recognize something of the kind of distribution of elements, but what I wanted to point out is that th these white things, which two of which are folded up and one of which is stretched over this frame in this image and all three are laid out parallel to each other in this image are body bags. So it's about death or the potential of death or a placeholder for a dead body or a place for a body and the sound in this work are drifting shortwave radio voices coming in and out of focus and there are these aquarium lights and wire and pieces of rubber and things that are all about electricity and being alive or you know having some nervous energy and the, 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 the short wave is like static, like crackling electrical energy and stuff. And I felt that this also has a kind of connection to the, the Eros and Thanatos piece. So there's a level at which uh, I didn't have these in mind at all when I was making it and yet as I began to go further with my work the fact that these images have recurred made it even more convincing to me that the new work was something that I wanted to continue with and I was very happy with it. But I, w I want to thank again uh, Joanna very much for supporting me in making this work which she never saw and I never saw and uh, came about uh, because I was able to use the gallery for my studio for a period of time and uh, I'm very happy with the results and I, I, I hope everybody gets some good uh, experience from it. So uh, let's uh, turn on the lights please and I'll, we can turn off the projectors and I'll answer any questions that anybody might have. Yeah. Well that's an interesting question. You know um, I was very interested in Beckett when I was a teenager. I, I thought that Beckett's bleak view of humanity really spoke to me. And as I got older I stopped thinking about Beckett and stopped reading it because I, it was the situations of his characters that didn't really grab me anymore. And as I started working on these pieces people kept pointing out to me, gee this is so Beckett-like. And so I went back and I actually started, uh, I read the uh, biography that Deirdre Bear wrote of him and found something which I didn't know which was that Beckett had been uh, analyzed by uh, Bion, who was one of uh, Melanie Klein's uh, associates, someone who trained with Melanie Klein. It was probably the craziest analyst alive uh, in, in, in the, I mean, since psychoanalysis began. And Bion was somebody whose ideas I was very interested in. So I went back and looked more at Beckett and actually now I'm in the midst of producing Beckett's play as an animatronic performance because uh, in his stage directions he gives a methodology for having it repeat endlessly in variations and the 
characters are not supposed to have any emotion. They're supposed to speak in monotone voices. They don't move. So everything is perfect. And the human element in play is the moving spotlight that moves between the figures. And what Beckett said was that this shouldn't be done by just turning stationary lights on and off, but needs to reflect the unique movement of an individual. So what I'm working on now is how to make it feel as if a computer controlling that moving spotlight has the, 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 the sort of unevenness and in a way gestural capacity that a person moving a spotlight would have. So putting the intelligence again in a phantom body, the one that's behind the spotlight, which is actually not there at all, and taking the humanity out of the characters and giving them over to Beckett's sort of, you know, they're supposed to be in urns, funeral urns in the play. And um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that literally or not, but um, I'm hoping that I can get away with it without the, the Beckett estate chopping my feet off. I think if I don't do it in a theater, it'll be okay. But the minute it goes near a theater, I have to, you have, one has to get their approval, and they're notorious for, if you don't follow the stage directions perfectly, you can't do it. So, but I, I'm very interested in his view, his his disappointment in humanity or his feeling that people are just going in circles and making a mess of their lives because they can't stop making the same conceptual mistakes over and over again, how they can't stop being pulled down by their own desires in a way that leaves them blind or makes them want something that's impossible or whatever. So the story in play about you know, these two women and a man, and one of them claims to have had an affair with the guy, and the other one claims to be the wife, and yet they change roles around, and the guy is saying none of this ever happened, and this sort of un, un, inability of the audience to ever find a narrative in the characters. I mean, this interests me very much. So I think, ultimately, I will get to a level where I understand Beckett better and not worry about what the characters are talking about so much. And, but I still, you know, it's a, it's a question of style in a way. And also because he abandoned English and I can only read the stuff in translation, I think that un until I, you know, maybe can somehow find a way to understand it in a different way and not about the language itself. But um, yeah, I'm definitely, just because so many people have brought it to my attention. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm struck with the opposite of that, which is where they become the trickster or the magic device. Yeah, except I know they're not because I wrote their complete <laughs> interiority. Yeah. Well, but in a way that, you know, so I, I have trouble thinking of them in that respect. Certainly they can represent, they can evoke images of that. And certainly some of the projected images as characters, as characters begin to evoke feelings of that. Uh, but knowing that they have no uh, secrets, um, uh, yeah, I'm kind of torn about it. Right, right, right. I think I think what works are ultimately is you know, a mixture of what I put in there and what you bring to it. So if your orientation knows those narratives, then they become significant. I was on a, a panel discussion a uh, year or two years ago with Jean Baudrillard and I, you know, I was trying to tell him, this reminded me of this Native American story about the, the turtle that holds up the world and the son asked the grandpa, well, what holds up that turtle? And the son says, it's another turtle. And he says, well, what, what's holds up that one? Another turtle. And he says, well, what holds up that one? And he says, listen, son, it's no use. It's turtles all the way down. So I told Baudrillard this joke and hoping that this whole notion of the procession of the simulacrum, he would realize that there was no first thing that was real. Because that's what for me was always wrong with Baudrillard was that the simulacrum idea implies that there's something behind it, that there's a real thing. He didn't get it. He didn't think it was. <laughs> so either I didn't tell it very well or he didn't want to hear it or whatever. But to me, that was like the ultimate you know, engagement of his work from my point of view, and yet to him it was a mystery, like what is this guy trying to tell me? 
So <laughs> it's just funny that way. Yeah. No, it changes. It changes all the time. In relation to that, the question about taxes, too. Yeah, yeah. Kind of ethical yeah, it, it really changes all the time. It's always provisional. And that's why when I look at my work over a much longer period of time, it's gone through it's been so many genres, and I've worked with so many different materials, because I'm not someone who likes to repeat myself. And if I've really solved a problem, then I, I want to go on to something else. And I. This is actually the first body of work that I'm producing more and more variations because I, I feel like I put my finger on something that I haven't explored to my satisfaction yet. But the, the point at which I feel like I, I kind of know it all about it, I'm sure I'm going to stop doing it and do something else. And I probably will come to hate this stuff as much as I don't you know, like the other stuff either. It's, I think that's what happens when you're really trying to to keep the work fresh is that you, because it, you know you know what's in there and you know what you didn't address and you know what questions you still have that you sort of patched over. You know, no, I'm not gonna, I can't deal with that right now. Or, you know, like I was talking with Joanna the other day about how you can even look back a couple of weeks and feel like you're so much smarter than you were two weeks ago, and that's, you know, probably not. It's like that feeling when you're. You know, you're, you're in a restaurant and you're trying to impress somebody, you're on a date and you're trying to be like really clever and say something and you know, the next person at the next table is listening to you and thinking, what a jerk, you know, what a stupid jerk. If I was on a date with that guy, I would run for the hills, you know. And how many times you've been on the other side of it where you're listening to the person that you think they're a jerk and then you never imagine that you're the jerk. But in fact, with art, you're constantly being reminded what a jerk you are because it's just that way, you know, the work is never completely satisfactory and your questions keep popping up and you realize, oh, did I, you know, I'm repeating myself, I'm doing the same thing and I'm not making, uh, I'm not getting at what I really want to get at. So when you feel that period of time when you're really getting at things, I think that's what you really want as an artist and not to feel like this is a methodology, because that scares me too, but that this is something I have a grasp on for the moment it's like having the bit in your mouth and being able to run with it. You, know? you never know when it's going to hurt too much or when you have to drop it or when you get bored and tired of it. I think this is a, maybe one of the places where the work is still developing is that I'm still making characters and I'm still telling myself they're not me. So they're people who fight and I'm not like that. They're people who don't know their own nature and they think that they're less or more violent than somebody else. I'm not like that. So I'm saying that they're, they're, they're confused. So I'm creating this confusion in order to talk about something in a way. That that's, that's what the piece is about in a way. And maybe if I could make something that could speak about things the way that I speak about the work, it would be about talking about what they're about. I don't, but I don't know what that is yet. So it's a process. And I think that they, they sort of overlap and go apart and they come together. and. You know, what an artist has to say about their work 
always stands next to the work, and the work has to speak for itself. And what you can't say about the work, maybe somebody else understands better. And what you have to say about the work sometimes is just a fog that gets in the way of the work, and you've got to forget about it. And I don't know. Um, things that I don't understand attract me a lot more than things that I do understand. So maybe it's that ambiguity in the work of what exactly is the point where they're going off. Why are they like miscommunicating? And that, that the miscommunication is more like human nature than, I'm just talking, I'm not communicating, I'm not having a conversation with, with people, I'm just talking. So I could, have, I could make pieces that give talks and give speeches and stuff, but I don't know if I could have them having a conversation on that level. Maybe I have to learn it first, or maybe I have to get past all this debating and arguing. And it's, it's still really new material for me to even have these pieces talking with each other. I mean, it's a relatively short period of time, like, you know, the first one was 2001, so it's really just three years I've been working on it. And each piece is really a long process of writing the software and making the sculpture and thinking about what I want it to be. And, as I was saying about not letting, not falling into the project mode, I tend to keep things in the studio for a long time, uh, at least in some sort of developing form, and so that I can actually know what it is and, and, and feel that it's developing. And so I don't make a lot of work. So it's just happening kind of on a glacial <laughs> time scale. <laughs> and it's okay with me. But yeah, it's sometimes it's frustrating because you, you feel like you're getting be ahead of the work or you. You know things about the work that you can't get in the work. And yes. Yeah. Well, the ones that look like me are actually molded from my head, so they should. I mean, it was like I sat and had latex and plaster put over me, so I just gained weight since that mold was made. So they look kind of like me, but they actually were me at some point. Um, the, the guy in the flower pot, though, looks more like my grandpa. That was just sculpted head. That wasn't cast from anybody, and it was a sort of family resemblance thing, although it started out to be a little bit different. It sort of, that was one of those things that just sort of happened. Uh, I was working on it, working on it, and then I stepped back and said, Guess who that is? <laughs> My wise old grandpa had lots of things to say. And um, I guess, in a certain way, it's a placeholder for not making a decision about who it is. In other words, I don't want it to be about uh, a, a certain type of a person. I don't want to raise the issues of why did you pick that? gender or that ethnicity or that age. So using myself as a kind of transparent, for me, way to feel like, let's be honest here. I wanted a talking head, so let's just use me. But there, there of course, is such a long history of artists using their own appearance in their work, uh, you know, from portraits, self-portraits, to people like Dennis Oppenheim making these little marionettes with his own head that, that did sort of dances and talked and things like that. Um, I think it's a metaphor for the fact that what part of the process is about is putting something out there to help you understand who you are. And if it looks like you, it makes it even a little bit more obvious that that's what it's about. Um, I don't do really think about it consciously that way, but I can't deny that these are surrogates for myself. And, and, and in fact, um, that self-portrait piece was included in a, an exhibition about performance art where the curator said, well, this is, a, this is a work where there's a surrogate performer where the artist has made a dummy of himself to do a performance that would otherwise have, in other versions of performance art, have been done by a live person. And the fact that I had um, used three versions of my own head having different personalities to me also talks about how they really are just the same. But you, th you imagine when you think about something, you're trying to analyze something from different points of view, 
you really have to admit that you can't, you're not really taking on different points of view. You're looking at different parts of yourself in a way. Um, but there's another philosophical aspect about that not quite clear to me why that's a more comfortable figure to use. The other one that I like, you know, the, the characters that are in you um, that are, were also in the if-then piece are aesthetically my favorites. I like them much better and I would prefer to have them in, probably in all of my pieces. There's a certain fear of using the same head too much where they get sort of overexposed in a way and I, I can't see them anymore. But those, those heads, especially the ones that are here with that smirk, they really make me queasy. I mean, that smirk was just, I, I wanted to destroy them when I saw it. So that level of anxiety that it creates telling me that there's something active in the piece and so it's okay. Um, I think when your work makes you uncomfortable, there's a good reason, something not to just let go of. Yes. Well, I guess first I'd want to say that I, I, I do see the works in continuity with those and these discussions about truth are my version of a parlor game. <laughs>